Expand your vocabulary with our core 2000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free Spanish ebook before it's gone. Imagine you're at a local market and you want to buy something. What do you do? Hola, soy Alex. Alex here. Anyone can learn how to buy souvenirs at a local market. In this lesson, you'll learn how. Mark and Sasha are at a local market. They are talking to a vendor. Let's watch. Hola, ¿vende plata? Buenas tardes. ¿Sí? Quiero una pulsera de plata. ¿Tiene algún diseño en mente? Quiero una pulsera de plata con un dije de estrella. Tengo estos modelos. Este me gusta. ¿Me lo puedo probar? ¡Claro! ¡Permítame! Nos llevamos este. ¿Cuánto cuesta? Son mil pesos. Aquí tiene. Gracias por su compra. Now with English. Hola, ¿vende plata? Buenas tardes, ¿sí? Quiero una pulsera de plata. ¿Tiene algún diseño en mente? Quiero una pulsera de plata con un dije de estrella. Tengo estos modelos. Este me gusta, ¿me lo puedo probar? Claro, permítame. Nos llevamos este, ¿cuánto cuesta? Son mil pesos. Aquí tiene. Gracias por su compra. Here are the keywords from the scene. Vender. Vender. To sell. Ven. Ver. Vender. Vender. Gracias por su compra. Gracias por su compra. Thank you for your purchase. Gracias por su compra. Gracias por su compra. Gracias por su compra. Querer. Querer. To want. Querer. 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 Tener. Tener. To have. Tener. 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 Probar. Probar. To try on. Probar. 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 Me gusta. Me gusta. I like it. Me gusta. Me gusta. Me gusta. And now, a breakdown of some of the Spanish you heard in the scene. How does Sasha ask what the vendor sells in the scene? Vende plata? Vende plata? Vende plata? Do you sell products made of silver? The word vende is the polite question form of the verb vender, to sell, and the word plata, silver. You can use this phrase whenever you want to ask a vendor what they sell. Simply say vende and add what you would like to ask about. For example, if you want to ask if the vendor sells coffee, you can say vende café. Do you sell coffee? Café means coffee. Now you try. Say Sasha's line. Hola. ¿Vende plata? How does Sasha ask for the type of bracelet she wants? Quiero una pulsera de plata. Quiero una pulsera de plata. Quiero una pulsera de plata. I want a silver bracelet. The word 
quiero, I want, comes from the verb querer, to want. The next words are una, a for feminine nouns, pulsera, bracelet, and de plata, literally of silver. This is a very convenient phrase in Spanish. To ask for what you want, simply say quiero, I want, and add what you would like. For example, if you want to buy chocolate amargo, bitter chocolate, a popular item in that region, you can say quiero chocolate amargo. I want bitter chocolate. Now you try. Say Sasha's line. ¿Tiene algún diseño en mente? Quiero una pulsera de plata. Now, the lesson focus. Here is how to buy something at a local market. Mexican local markets sell all kinds of goods, from meat to vegetables to arts and crafts. You will find most souvenir goods in more touristy areas. Remember, many local markets are just stands, or small shops without doors, so it's easy to spot what you are looking for, even if there aren't any signs. Some of the most popular souvenir goods from Mexico are clay, gold, and silver. You can find these goods at Mercados de Artesanías or Mercado Artesanal. Crafts markets located mainly in the downtown area of many cities. The names of some famous crafts markets are Mercado de Artesanías de Taxco in Guerrero and Mercado Artesanal de Pátzcuaro in Michoacán. So be sure to check them out. Here is how to get what you want at a local market. If you want to know if the vendor you are visiting sells something, simply ask Vende and add what you want to know about. If you would like to know how much something costs, you can use the phrase ¿Cuánto cuesta? How much does it cost? Or ¿Me puede dar el precio de esto? Are you able to give me the price of this? While pointing at the object you want to know about. If you would like to buy more than one item, you can ask for the total cost. To do that, simply ask, ¿Cuánto es en total? How much is it in total? If you would like to buy something and think it costs too much, it is all right to ask for a discount. To do that, simply say, ¿Me puede hacer un descuento? Are you able to give a discount? Or, ¿Me puede dar un mejor precio? Can you give me a better price? Remember to always add, Por favor. Please, at the end of your sentence, so that you sound more polite and receive friendlier treatment from vendors. Remember, even though people in Mexico are very respectful and friendly, some vendors may overprice their items for tourists. So it is good to look around first and compare prices before buying anything. Now, it's time to practice your new ability. You are at your first local market in Mexico. Ready? Here we go. How do you ask the vendor if they sell coffee? Vende café. How do you ask how much something costs? ¿Cuánto cuesta? How do you ask for a better price? ¿Me puede dar un mejor precio? How do you say please to sound more polite? Por favor. Great job. ¿Vende café? ¿Cuánto cuesta? ¿Me puede dar un mejor precio? Por favor. Buen trabajo. Now, watch the scene one more time. After that, you're ready to go to a local market. Have a great time. Hasta pronto. Hola. ¿Vende plata? Buenas tardes. ¿Sí? Quiero una pulsera de plata. ¿Tiene algún diseño en mente? Quiero una pulsera de plata con un dije de estrella. Tengo estos modelos. Este me gusta. ¿Me lo puedo probar? ¡Claro! ¡Permítame! Nos llevamos este. ¿Cuánto cuesta? Son mil pesos. Aquí tiene. ¡Gracias por su compra!
Hola a todos, me llamo Rosa. En esta lección me gustaría hablar de la noche que con más ilusión esperan todos los niños españoles. Como ya mencioné en el vídeo en que hablo de la Navidad, en España tradicionalmente los niños reciben sus regalos no de Santa Claus, sino de los Reyes Magos. La noche de la que os hablo es pues la anterior al 6 de enero, fiesta de la Epifanía o Día de Reyes. ¿Sabes qué suelen recibir los niños que se portaron mal durante el año? Os enseñaré la respuesta al final del vídeo. En este día se celebra la visita de los tres reyes magos de Oriente al niño Jesús recién nacido. Estos le llevan como regalo oro, incienso y mirra. Hoy en día son ellos también los que dejan regalos a todos los niños de España, aunque en este caso antes los reyes reciben cartas de todos los niños con lo que les gustaría recibir. Si lo prefieren, también pueden contárselo a ellos directamente. Es fácil encontrarlos en la zona de juguetes de los grandes centros comerciales. Por la tarde y noche, en muchos pueblos y ciudades sale a la calle la cabalgata de los Reyes Magos. Estas están formadas por carrozas en las que niños y adultos participan disfrazados. Las carrozas más importantes son siempre las tres en las que vemos a los Reyes Magos. Desde todas las carrozas se tiran caramelos e incluso algunos pequeños juguetes. Niños y no tan niños intentan atrapar el mayor número posible. Una vez acabada la cabalgata, los niños vuelven a casa. Esta noche toca acostarse temprano, porque si los reyes ven que el niño está despierto, no dejarán ningún regalo. Antes de acostarse, es importante preparar algo de beber y un mantecado dulce para los reyes, que llegan cansados tras el largo viaje. Es bueno dejar también algo de agua para los camellos. Y tras una noche en la que muchos no consiguen apenas dormir por los nervios, a abrir los regalos. La cabalgata de los Reyes de Granada es la más antigua de España. Tiene 100 años de tradición y en ella se reparten en total unas 10 toneladas de caramelos. Y ahora voy a daros la respuesta a la pregunta que lancé antes. ¿Sabes qué suelen recibir los niños que se portaron mal durante el año? Parece que Santa Claus y los Reyes Magos se pusieron de acuerdo, porque ellos también dan carbón a los niños que se portan mal. De todos modos, no suele disgustarle a los niños recibirlo. La mayoría de las veces es dulce. ¿Qué tal esta lección? ¿Aprendiste algo interesante? ¿Quién trae los regalos en tu país? Por favor, deja tu comentario en SpanishPod101.com. ¡Hasta la próxima! Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly review, the monthly show on language learning, where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is, are you an introvert or an extrovert? and how to speak more of your target language. Since you're learning the language, then you're very much aware of the importance of speaking, which can be easy if you're an extrovert or hard if you're an introvert. So how can you speak more if you're on the shy side? Keep watching this month's episode. You'll discover who learns faster, extroverts or introverts, why learning a language can help you become more extroverted and five ways to speak more, even if you're an introvert. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Sport and Exercise Conversation Cheat Sheet. Want to talk about fitness in your target language? You'll learn over 50 words and phrases for sports and exercise with this brand new cheat sheet. Second, the 40 words and phrases for ordering food writing workbook. With this free resource, you'll pick up must-know words and phrases for the restaurant and practice writing them out as well. Third, the top 12 April Fool's phrases. Want to be able to say some outrageous phrases in your target language for April Fool's Day? Then you'll want this April Fool's phrase list. Fourth, can you talk about your bones in your target language? Learn how to say words like skull, ribs, spine, and much more with this quick vocab bonus. Fifth, 20 must-know jewelry vocabulary. Do you know how to say earrings or necklace in your target language? If you don't, then this vocab lesson is for you. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. 
Are you an introvert or an extrovert? And how to speak more of your target language. Part one, do extroverts or introverts learn languages faster? If you've ever wondered whether introverts or extroverts learn the language faster, there have been studies done on this. And as you'd expect, extroverts do have an advantage when it comes to speaking and overall conversational skills. Of course, these studies didn't take into account mistakes you may make, such as grammar, vocab, etc. And introverts? Introverts tend to observe and listen more, and tend to be better listeners. Do you agree with these findings? Leave a comment. So the key takeaway is they each have their own advantages. One has something that the other lacks. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If you speak less, your speaking skills will be weaker. And if you want to just speak a lot, you get good at speaking, but miss out on the other skills like listening and reading. So unfortunately, you can't really say who learns faster based on personality alone, just that each one has their advantages and disadvantages. But personality aside, success with a language will always depend on your attitude towards learning itself and how much time you put in. The person that has a better chance of becoming fluent will always be the one that puts in more time to learn, practice, get feedback, adjust with the feedback, and not so much about whether they're extroverted or introverted. But what if you're an introvert who wants to be able to speak more? Is there a way to become more extroverted? Part two, how to speak more, even if you're an introvert. There are ways to become more extroverted, at least more than your usual self. How? Well, first by learning a language. When you learn a language, you have a natural desire to connect with native speakers, even if you're shy. Also, native speakers tend to be very supportive and welcoming when you're trying to learn their language. So even if you're shy, it's kind of hard to stay shy in the long run when the people you speak with are so encouraging. In your native language, even if you know a million ways to start a conversation, you might not try to speak to someone because you're worried about whether you have something clever to say or the timing or some other social aspect. But in another language where you may only know a few phrases, you're not bogged down by that. You just do the best you can with the few phrases you have. Plus, learning a language alone gives you a chance to reinvent yourself. To learn another language is to acquire another soul, as the quote goes. So learning a language alone puts you on a path towards becoming more extroverted. But if you want specific tips, here are five ways to speak more, even if you're an introvert. Number one. Learn how to listen like an introvert. How can this help you to speak more? Introverts tend to listen more, and the better listener you become, the better questions you can ask, which results in a more meaningful conversation, which also means more speaking time for you. So you can speak more, even if you consider yourself an introvert, by listening well and asking relevant and pertinent questions. By the way, if you want to learn how to ask questions, then check out our top 25 questions you need to know, where you'll learn all about what to ask and answer regarding the most common conversational questions. Number two, increase speaking time and confidence through experience. Simply put, the more experiences you have in life or experience with certain topics, the more knowledgeable you become. And as your life or work experiences grow, so will your audience you'll find people coming to you to talk to you. It could be about business, travel, or just your own life stories. If a conversation is about France, and if you've been to France, the conversation will gravitate towards you. Having all that experience makes things easy for you as an introvert. People will come to you, so you don't have to find them. For a language learner, the tricks are to, one, be knowledgeable about something, and two, be able to talk about your experience in the target language. Number three. Find the right audience. Imagine talking to someone that's not interested in learning languages. They'll give you 100 reasons why they can't learn, never reasons why it might work out for them, right? But when you're talking to an audience that's interested in languages, then you can have a conversation that could go on for hours. So find the right audience to share with. With language learning, it means you need to find native speakers that share the same hobbies or interests as you. Number four, talk about what you know best. The introvert-extrovert dynamic also depends on how much you know about a topic and what you're most comfortable with. There are topics you may not know enough about, so you won't talk as much. But even the biggest introvert can become a confident speaker once you touch upon a topic they know well. That's where they shine. 
So if your goal is to be more extroverted, then focus on the things you know about. Or you can always gain experience in topics you don't know much about so you can speak more. Number five, create opportunities to speak. How? Well, it's hard to stop a stranger and start talking with them without any context, right? But what if you need help finding something at a store or have a question about a dish at a restaurant? Then it's much easier since you're there with a purpose. So you can create these opportunities by going to a restaurant from the country that speaks your target language and speaking with the staff, or asking a taxi driver a question, or asking staff at an information booth a question. So to recap, if you want to speak more, even if you're an introvert, one, listen like an introvert. Two, increase speaking time and confidence through experience. Three, find the right audience. Four, talk about what you know best. And five, create opportunities to speak. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about how tipping points will bring you closer to your language goals. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Hola a todos, soy Rosa. En esta lección vas a aprender un poco acerca de una de las fiestas que reúnen los elementos más tradicionales del sur de España. Se trata de la Feria de Abril, que se celebra en Sevilla solo dos semanas después de la Semana Santa. En ocasiones es tan solo una semana después si por esperar dos semanas ya no cayese en abril. En 2014 cae del 5 al 11 de mayo y en 2015 del 21 al 26 de abril. ¿Sabes por qué se empezó a celebrar la Feria de Abril? Os enseñaré la respuesta al final del vídeo. A la Feria de Abril se la podría considerar como una pequeña ciudad efímera. Cuando entras en sus calles, a ambos lados puedes ver las casetas adornadas con flores, farolillos de papel y banderines. La mayoría de estas casetas pertenecen, sin embargo, a familias, grupos de amigos o asociaciones, por lo que el acceso no es libre en muchas. En estas casetas normalmente encuentras la zona de baile y la zona del bar. Además de las casetas, hay muchísimas atracciones para niños y no tan niños, pubs, puestos de comida... Imposible aburrirse. Las sevillanas, como es tradición, suelen lucir sus trajes típicos de flamenca durante todo el día. A media mañana es hora de ver el paseo de caballos, con coloridos carros de caballos y jinetes y amazonas que muestran sus habilidades. Sobre las 5 de la tarde es costumbre ir a las corridas de toros y más tarde, si aún hay energía, se volverá al recinto ferial. Allí lo que espera es toda una noche de atracciones, canto y baile hasta la mañana siguiente. Como otras celebraciones, la Feria de Abril tiene sus comidas y bebidas típicas. Es sobre todo tradición cenar pescadito frito el lunes, antes de que se enciendan las luces del recinto ferial. El resto de días lo más común es ir de tapeo, con tapas tanto frías como calientes. Gazpacho, boquerones en vinagre, el pescadito frito que dijimos, jamón, queso... De dulces encontramos buñuelos y churros. De bebidas, la más típica es el rebujito, hecha con vino fino y 7-Up, una bebida gaseosa de lima limón. Hay personas que de resaca les apetece un plato de pasta, algo frito. Durante la feria de abril, sin embargo, lo más común es tomar una buena ración de churros con chocolate tras una larga noche de baile. Y ahora voy a daros la respuesta a la pregunta que lancé antes. ¿Sabes por qué se empezó a celebrar la feria de abril? El origen de la Feria de Abril es el de una feria de ganado. Aunque hoy en día se sigue celebrando, ha cedido protagonismo a un espectáculo de folclore extraordinario. ¿Qué tal esta lección? ¿Aprendiste algo interesante? ¿Hay alguna celebración similar a la Feria de Abril en tu país? Por favor, deja tu comentario en SpanishPod101.com. ¡Hasta la próxima! Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. 
Hello, friend from SpanishPod101.com. My name is Diego. And my name is Efraín. If you want to speak like a true Mexican, you gotta learn the slang. So, in this video, we will cover the most common Mexican slang words. So, we hope that you enjoy it. We already know that Mexican food is delicious. But what about some slang words? that are related to food and drinks. The first example we have is fresa. So basically, you can translate fresa as strawberry. But in Mexico, if you call someone fresa, it means that he comes from a wealthy family and normally is a person who is self-centered uh, and also could be very materialistic. And they have like a special accent which Efrain is going to imitate now. I Me? Mean? Yeah, you are. Pero no mames, güey. Ya no voy a... Qué oso. Qué oso, qué oso. So, that's basically how a fresa speaks. The next one is aguas, which means be careful. Directly, you can translate it as waters. <laughs> But we never use that. We, we never say it. that. We, no. we just say aguas, like, hey, watch out, or be careful. Next one is a huevo. <laughs> which which can be translated as X or F. That's a literal translation. But we don't mean that when we say a huevo. A huevo is fuck yeah. Yeah. Men, saqué 10 en el examen a huevo. huevo. <laughs> In Mexico, we have some slang phrases related to family. So it is common to hear words like Padre or madre in a conversation. The first example we have is que padre. So, que padre could be translated literally as what father. But of course, we don't try to say that when we say que padre. So, we try to convey rather cool or awesome. For example, Efraín, la próxima semana voy a ir a Europa. Oh, que padre! Muy, muy padre. <laughs> Now, the second common phrase is related to the mother, with the word madre. So, we could say, me vale madre, which is literally, it is word mother. But of course, that's not what we try to convey. It will be rather, I don't care. For example, Diego, la otra vez oí de parte de uno de mis amigos que tu novia está diciendo que eres un tarado y que eres gay. Oh. <laughs> pues me vale madre lo que yo opine. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, um, the next one is poca madre, which means or can be translated directly like less mother or little mother. But here in Mexico, it means something cool or something really bad. It depends on the context. We're gonna give you three examples. No manches. Acabo de comprar un videojuego y está de poca madre, Diego. De poca madre. Lo he jugado toda la noche de hoy. Wow. Pero es la tarde. ¿Qué? ¿Qué <risa> poca madre? Poca madre. ¿Qué poca madre. Poca madre. No me di cuenta. <risa> Oye, Fray, esta sudadera está de poca madre. Lo sé. Muy bonita, ¿eh? Por eso me la puse. Oye, no manches, por cierto, te iba a contar, hace rato de, de venir a tu casa me vine en un taxi y le pagué al taxista con un billete de 100, pero me regresó el cambio con un billete falso. Ay, qué poca madre, no puede ser. Ya sé. The next is when we use the word pedo. In English it means fart. So we can use this word for many things. First for a uh, greeting. So we can greet someone by saying que pedo, which means what's up. We can also use it for an adjective, which is again pedo, like él está pedo. It means that he is drunk. And finally, we can use it as a noun. In the feminine word, in the feminine version, is la peda. And la peda means a party. And in the masculine version is pedo, it's gonna be translated as problema. So we can say la peda, la fiesta, and 
No hay pedo. There's no problem. Let's see an example. ¿Qué pedo, Efraín? ¿Qué haces? Estamos grabando. Oh, perdón, es que eh, se va a hacer una peda ya en la casa de José y deberíamos ir. Oh, esas piezas son muy buenas. Todo mundo termina pedo ahí. Yo creo que, de hecho, José me está diciendo que ya están pedos todos allá. Oh. El único problema es que está lejos. ¿Dónde es? Es por tabachines. Ay, oh, no puede ser. Bueno, no hay pedo, vamos, vamos. Vamos, vamos, vamos de una vez. Finally, we are gonna give you 12 more examples of typical slang words here in Mexico. The first one is no manches, which means no way. ¿Qué onda? Is the same as que pedo, so it means what's up. Next one is estoy crudo, which means I'm hungover. Then we can say eso que ni que for no doubt about it. Next one is, ¿Tienes feria? Do you have change? Then we can say, Te quedes muy muy, for you think you're a bad ass. The other word is chela, which means beer. Then we can say, ¿A poco? Really? Another word that I like a lot is esta cañón, which means it's rough. We can also say, chido, for cool. Next. It's an essential word here in Mexico, way, which means dude. It was used to refer to someone who is stupid, but now it is dude. It's just dude. And finally, we have mande, which you can normally use it when you didn't hear well, or a synonym of que or como. So it is what? Mande? That's it for today, friends from SpanishPod101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed the video. If so, please give us your thumbs up. And if you have any opinion, let us know in the comment section. Nos vemos en el siguiente video. ¡Hasta luego! Hey everyone, welcome to The Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is, can busy people actually learn a language? You yourself probably have an answer to this question, right? But whether you can or can't actually has a bit more to do with your mindset than anything else. And in this guide, you'll discover, one, is it possible for busy people to learn a language and the mindset needed? Two, mental bandwidth, the one thing that can make or break your language goals. And three, five mindset tricks to make time for language. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Talking Online PDF Cheat Sheet. Learn the must-know internet slang and all the internet-related vocab and phrases in your target language with this PDF Cheat Sheet. And second, the 40 words and phrases for ordering food writing workbook. With this free resource, you'll pick up must-know words and phrases for the restaurant and practice writing them out as well. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Can busy people actually learn a language? Part one, is it possible for busy people to learn a language and the mindset needed? So, can busy people actually learn a language? What do you think? Leave us a comment and let us know. As much as we want to say yes, it's more of a yes or no depending on the person. Why yes? Yes, because many of our members are busy and are learning with our system. And some of you who are watching also fall into this camp. But it also depends on the person because it's more of a mindset thing. Either you think you have time or you don't. For example, many of our members fall into the group of can learn and can find the time, even if they're busy. 
If you're busy and still want to learn, if you look around, you can always find five or 10 minutes a day, like on a commute. Now, if your mindset is the opposite, if you think you can't learn a language or you don't have time, you won't even try, even if you had a resource that was proven to work. Part two, mental bandwidth, the one thing that can make or break your language goals. And if you think about it, if you had all the time in the world but felt like you couldn't learn a language, you wouldn't try either. Again, this is why it comes down to the mindset and why it all depends on each individual person. Either you think you can or you think you can't. But it may not always be this black and white either. It can also depend on your mental bandwidth too. Think back to your school days, those few days before exams. It got really busy and you had to stop everything to study, right? You were probably thinking, if I can just get through studying this week and take the test, then next week I can finally start relaxing and doing other things. And if someone asked you if you wanted to hang out, you would say no, because you're busy. But chances are you still manage to spend at least 30 minutes on YouTube or social media. Meaning you did have some time, even if you were busy. But the test was occupying your mind and taking up all that bandwidth. So it's also possible that we just don't have the mental bandwidth because we're overwhelmed. And this is a genuine reason for not being able to learn when you're busy. Don't worry, in the next part, we'll show you how to get some bandwidth so that you don't feel overwhelmed. Part three, five mindset tricks to make time for language. So if you've gotten this far, you understand that it is possible to start learning a language, even if you're busy, that you can find the time, but it mostly comes down to your mindset. So how can you develop the mindset? So when you're too busy, it feels like you're overwhelmed and like you don't have control of your time. Well, there are a few things you can do to gain some control of your time, have some breathing room and learn a bit of language. First, Always set small, measurable goals. This is something that we talk a lot about here. For example, learn for 10, 15, or 20 minutes every day. Learn 100 words in one month, which means learning three to four words a day. And the mindset behind this is just being realistic with your goals and what you can do. Because if you're busy, you may not have one or two hours. And this is a strict rule, especially when starting out with new goals and languages. Always stick to small, measurable goals. Second, lowering your goals and expectations is okay when things get super busy. If you couldn't learn all 100 words for the month and only got up to 40 or 60, that's okay. If you tried learning on Monday and Tuesday but skipped Wednesday and Thursday, that's okay. Sometimes you have to shift priorities, and prioritizing things is a secret to a successful life. You may not get to the goal you wanted to achieve today, but you can get to it next week. Third, it's okay to put language on pause if life gets in the way. Just like with that last point, you can always come back and reach your goal a little later. We often see learners put language on pause, come back later. Some even come back years later, but the key is to come back. Fourth, avoid the all or nothing mindset at all costs. And an all or nothing mindset is something you'll see in beginners and perfectionists. When you have this mindset, you'll say, language learning requires hours, so there's no point in learning for a few minutes today. But something is better than nothing, and even five to 10 minutes of review adds up in the grand scheme. And in the grand scheme, it's more important to be consistent, even if it's just for a minute a day, rather than study for hours once a week. The brain just doesn't work that way. Fifth, do you have a slowdown or relaxing routine that you do on the weekends or whenever you have free time? And if you didn't do it, you'd feel overwhelmed? Leave us a comment and let us know what it is. For some, it could be reading, watching TV, or going to a cafe and doing nothing for a bit. You're there on your own, you don't have much to do in front of you, even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes. And if you're settled, you start feeling in control. And that's the point you have some mental bandwidth. You can start doing some time management and plan your week out. You can put in a few minutes of language learning. But if you don't slow down and if you feel overwhelmed, you could have the easiest possible way to learn a language. And you still wouldn't do it. So back to you. If you were busy, do you think you'd be able to learn a language? Leave us a comment. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. 
Do you record yourself speaking your target language? If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way, and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hey there, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. I'm Efraín. And I'm Diego. And today we are back for more just because you asked for it and now you have it. This is a very Mexican expression and it is... Orale! This word with so many meanings and enjoy, enjoy the video. video! Woo! So this expression was born precisely with the idea of hurrying up people. It comes from the word ahora, which means now. Then it became hora with H. And after that people just took took out the H and we had the word hora. Exactly. Uh, finally, Mexican people added LE just to make it an imperative, as we have stated in a previous video. If you haven't watched that video, please go watch it now. So, in that case, we could say something like, hora, hora, que te pasa? Or, orale, orale, que te pasa? Which means like, right now, What's going on with you? What's happening? After some time, people have adapted this word to convey many different meanings. And now we're going to give you eight different ways where you can use the word orally. Number one, I agree with you. Diego, ¿por qué no vamos a comer camarones ahorita que salgamos y acabemos el video? Orale, va, 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 vamos, vamos. Number two, come on. Diego, ya regálame tu sudadera. No, o sea, ¿cómo que crees? ya me la regale. Orale, no. orale, me queda bien no, bonita. No, no, bien, no, 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 no. Number three, bring it on. Diego, estás fuerte, pero yo creo que te puedo partir la cara, ¿eh? ¿Tú crees eso? Sí. Órale, a ver. Órale, perro. Órale, ah, ah, perro. Ok, tato, sí. ok, sí, sí, sí. <risa> Number four. <risa> Hurry up. <risa> ok, Diego, vamos a hacer porque ya terminando este video, tengo que irme a la casa de mi tía. Órale. Pues, órale, apúrate, órale, vamos órale. ya. We can also use órale to convey there you go. For example, Diego, préstame 50 pesos. Necesito para unos tacos y para gorditas. Uh, y sí, un agua. sí. Órale. Eh, pero me los devuelves mañana. Sí. Ok, so the next one is for just saying, ok. For example, um, oye, invité a Gerardo a grabar videos con nosotros. Eh, él va a explicar y, y lo demás y tú puedes, tú puedes vernos desde atrás de la cámara. Ah, órale. Sí, sí. Sí, está bien. Está bien. The next one is for conveying go ahead. For example, me andas del baño. Este. Uh, órale, no. ve al baño, no me digas. Eh, no, 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 espera. Tenemos que terminar esta parte. Órale, te toca hablar. Uh, uh, well, in that case, this expression means it's your turn. Last but not the least, we can use órale as a way to express that something is amazing. In Mexico, we use wow, but, but we can also use órale and Orale, yes, with that sound. Orale, for example, Diego, 
estaba viendo el otro día y en menos de tres días en SpanishPod101.com uno de nuestros videos alcanzó dos mil visitas. ¡Órale! ¡Sí! ¿De no verdad? Manches, en serio. Increíble. ¡Órale! That's it for today, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed the video. If so, please give it your thumbs up and share it with other learners. And also, if you have an opinion, please leave it in the comment section. We do read them. So, see you in the upcoming video. <laughs>
Diego, hoy es en menos de 15 minutos para llegar a tu casa. Pretty easy, right? Now, let's see equality. For the equality, we use tan como and tanto como. Tan como works for the adjectives. But wait, let's see how tan works all by itself. Tan means so, and it helps for intensifying an adjective. For example, ¿Qué hace ese frame? Estoy viendo a mi novia. Es tan hermosa. So, in this case, he's saying she's so beautiful. So, tan intensifies beautiful. Now, if you want to compare, you just want, you just need to add como. So, for example, I could say, mi novia es tan hermosa como la tuya. Pero Diego, tú no tienes novia. Anyway, so, let's see now, tanto como. Tanto como works for comparing the verbs. And just as más que and menos que, tan como goes together. Let's see one example. Efraín, vamos a pedir una pizza, pero una chica porque tú no comes mucho. Yo como seis rebanadas y tú dos. No, Diego, mejor una mediana. Yo como tanto como tú. Ok, perfecto. Finally, let's see the nouns. For the nouns, be careful because we can compare either countable nouns and uncountable nouns. For the countable nouns, we will use tantos como or tantas como. Be careful because that depends on the gender, tantos, masculine, tantas, feminine, and we add the S, tantos and tantas. So, let's see one example. Diego, en México hay tantos mexicanos como sombreros. Oye, eso es racista. I was just kidding, my friend. <laughs> well, anyway, so in that case, he's using tantos sombreros because you can count the sombreros. You can say one sombrero, two sombreros, three sombreros, and so on. Now, we can also compare the uncountable nouns, but for the uncountable nouns, we would rather use tanto and tanta. For example, en México hay tanta vida nocturna como en Amsterdam. Eso es. We use tanta como because we cannot count the nightlife. We cannot say one nightlife or two nightlives. No, that's why we just say tanta vida nocturna como. So now let's see one exercise for you to practice. I have 50 pesos and I have 20 pesos. What comparisons can you think of? I'll give you five seconds. Okay, we will give you some possible answers. Yo soy más rico que Diego. Diego tiene menos de 50 pesos. Yo tengo más de 20 pesos. Or even you can say Diego no tiene tanto dinero como Efraín. And although in this case I am using the equality form, I'm also negating it. So basically I'm saying I don't have as much money as Efraín. That's it my friends from the Spanish Pod 101.com. We hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give us your thumbs up and let us know your opinion here in the comment section. ¡Hasta luego! <risa> <risa> Hasta ahí está, eso estuvo bien. Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly review, the monthly show on language learning. 
where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is how to learn a language in 2022. If you're planning to learn a language in 2022, then this episode is for you, especially if you want to finally succeed with your New Year's resolution instead of failing or giving up in the next week or two. That's why today you'll discover one, the four critical steps you need to take when learning a new language, and two, how to set goals and New Year's resolutions that won't fail you in 2022. But first, if you're looking for some free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Using Opposites Conversation Cheat Sheet. With this new cheat sheet, you'll learn common opposite adjectives like near and far, hot and cold, and grammar rules on how to use these words in a sentence. Second, the How to Say Goodbye PDF Writing Workbook. With this printable PDF, you'll pick up some common parting greetings and be able to practice writing them out. Third, can you talk about cars in your target language? Learn how to say words like tire, windshield, headlights, and more with this quick vocab bonus. Fourth, must know words and phrases for public transportation. Learn how to say ticket, bus, train, and much more with this quick one minute lesson. Fifth, the 10 habits of highly effective language learners. Wondering which habits will help you succeed with language learning? Then check out this free lesson. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. How to learn a language in 2022. Part one, the four critical steps you need to take when learning a new language. Every time you start a new language, you should start with one, goals, two, anchor points, three, grammar, four, reading. What are these four steps and why do you need them to succeed with language learning? Let's jump in. The first one is goals. Everything starts with a goal, but your goal itself can also lead you to failure if you don't set it the right way. So more specifically, you need to set small, measurable monthly goals instead of just, I wanna learn a language and be fluent this year. We'll cover goals in the second part of this episode, so stay tuned. After goals, the second step is setting anchor points. What are anchor points? Imagine a small ship in the middle of a big lake. It's windy, lots of waves, and the ship is bobbing up and down, drifting all around. What would you use to stop the ship from drifting away? An anchor. And just like an anchor keeps the ship in place, anchor points keep you from drifting away from your language. So an anchor point is a connection to the language that keeps you attached to the language and motivated to learn the language. One great example is language school. Imagine you signed up and paid thousands of dollars up front. Paying that much would motivate you to make the most of your time there. It's also a big commitment, one that you can't easily back out of. And school dictates your schedule. You have to wake up early, you have to do homework. Your life revolves around the classes. And as such, language school and the language itself become anchor points that your life revolves around. Anchor points can also be family or a partner that speaks the language you're learning. You're around them, you're exposed to the language, so your motivation to learn gets a bit stronger. Buying a language learning program or textbook are also examples of good anchor points. You invested your hard-earned money, which means you're serious about learning. Plus, you wanna make sure your investment doesn't go to waste, so you're more motivated. If you're wondering if you have any anchor points, you already have at least one. You're watching our lessons on YouTube, but the more anchor points you have, the stronger your motivation will be. So if you're into music or TV shows in your target language, those can serve as anchor points too. These are things that connect you to the language and add a bit of motivation to learn more, or at the very least, understand what you're watching or listening to. We covered goals and anchor points. What's next? The third step is you must have a good grasp of grammar of your native language. Now, you might wonder, if you're learning a new language, why focus on your native language? Well, as native speakers, the problem is we know what good grammar sounds like, but we can't explain how or why our language works the way it works. 
So if you don't have a good grasp of grammar, the backbone or the rules of a language, then you'll have a tough time learning a new language. You'll jump in and start learning words and phrases, but you'll never learn how to put them together and make sentences. That's a common problem beginners have. Now, if you already know the grammar of your native language, how do you apply that to your target language? For example, if you're an English speaker, and if you know that English sentences follow the subject, verb, object pattern, and if you know that languages have specific sentence patterns, then you'd go look at patterns. Then, you'd have a good idea of how to create your own sentences, instead of learning random words first. Finally, the fourth step is reading. Reading is good simply because you can do it anywhere, anytime, and without a teacher. It's a skill you can get started on, on day one, on your own. Reading also tends to spill over into other areas. The more you read, the more words and grammar rules you come across. So you boost your vocabulary and grammar, which can seep into speaking and listening. If you read out loud, you're practicing two skills at once. Now we've covered what you need. Goals, anchor points, reading, and grammar. Setting anchor points, knowing your own grammar, and reading are simple enough. But how do you set goals that don't lead you to failure? Part 2. How to set goals and New Year's resolutions that won't fail you in 2022. The goal that you set can make or break your language learning journey. So setting the right goals makes all the difference between success and failure. Just think about all of the common New Year's resolutions. What comes to mind? Goals like, I want to be fluent someday. I want to speak the language. I want to lose weight. I want to save more money. These big, vague goals often lead to failure because you simply have no idea how to approach the goal and you don't know what you're aiming for. Instead, your goals should be small, measurable, and monthly. For example, speak one minute of conversation by the end of the month. Learn 100 words by the end of the month. Finish chapter one of your language textbook by the end of the month. If you're using our program, finish 20 audio lessons by the end of the month. All of these are small and specific. One minute, 100 words, one chapter, 20 audio lessons. This means that they're easy to reach, unlike something vague like fluency. They're also measurable. You know when you reach one minute. You can check if you know all 100 words or if you finished all 20 lessons. If you aim for fluency, you won't know when you hit it. It's too vague and too big of a goal, and it may take years to hit. Finally, all of these goals have a deadline, the end of the month. That would mean January 31st of this year. Deadlines give you a clear date to aim for, and without one, you'll forever be floating around without much progress. So set a deadline for the end of every month. So now that you know how to set small, measurable monthly goals, leave us a comment. What's your small, measurable monthly goal? And what's the deadline? So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Hola a todos, soy Rosa. En esta lección voy a hablar de una celebración muy especial para los cristianos en España. Es la Semana Santa y, como su nombre indica, dura toda una semana. Las fechas varían cada año y en 2014 se celebrará del 13 al 20 de abril. El Viernes Santo siempre es el primer viernes después de la primera luna llena posterior al equinoccio de primavera. ¿Qué deberías hacer el domingo de Ramos si quieres tener suerte? Os enseñaré la respuesta al final del vídeo. Dentro de esta semana, los días más importantes son el domingo de Ramos, que conmemora la llegada de Jesucristo a Jerusalén y se celebra llevando palmas y ramas de olivo a misa para que sean bendecidos con agua. El miércoles santo es el día de la traición de Judas a Jesús. En este día, en algunas regiones de España, los ciudadanos, con túnica negra y capirote y cargados de instrumentos de percusión, llenan la noche y el día siguiente con el estruendo de los tambores. El Viernes Santo, día de la pasión y muerte de Jesucristo, en el que encontramos representaciones del Vía Crucis, camino hacia la cruz, en iglesias y en las calles por medio de procesiones. 
En este día, la Iglesia Católica prohíbe además el consumo de carne. Finalmente, el domingo de Pascua o Resurrección. En algunas zonas se pintan huevos de colores, mientras en otras existen tradiciones como la de quemar muñecos de paja. La gastronomía tradicional durante esta fiesta se caracteriza por su austeridad, tanto en la elaboración como en sus ingredientes. Sin embargo, tenemos algunos platos típicos como la sopa de ajo en el norte o el bacalao en salazón. El bacalao se utiliza luego para hacer croquetas, buñuelos y tortillitas. Hay dulces que suelen consumirse especialmente en estas fechas, como las torrijas, pestiños o monas de pascua. Procesiones existen en muchos países, pero creo que no es exagerado decir que las de Semana Santa en el sur de España son de las más espectaculares. Las cofradías invierten gran cantidad de tiempo y dinero en el momento en el que podrán mostrar orgullosos sus pasos a fieles y curiosos. Tristemente, ocurre con cierta frecuencia el que durante esta semana llueva y tengan que cancelarse algunas salidas. Por esto, en estos días, es la lluvia la principal causa de decepciones para muchos. Puede que en las procesiones te llamen la atención los altos gorros en forma de cucurucho. Son los capirotes y tienen su origen en la Inquisición. Colocaban a los condenados por la Iglesia Católica en la Edad Media un gorro similar. Este llevaba pintadas figuras alusivas al delito o a su castigo. Y ahora voy a daros la respuesta a la pregunta que lancé antes. ¿Qué deberías hacer el Domingo de Ramos si quieres tener suerte? Pues según la tradición, este día hay que usar una prenda de ropa nueva. Es una costumbre bastante extendida e incluso tenemos un refrán que dice En Domingo de Ramos, quien no estrena, no tiene manos. Vale cualquier prenda o complemento, desde calcetines hasta trajes. ¿Qué tal esta lección? ¿Aprendiste algo interesante? ¿Se celebra la Semana Santa en tu país? Si no, ¿qué te ha parecido lo que has escuchado en esta lección? Por favor, deje su comentario en SpanishPod101.com. ¡Hasta la próxima! Hello, friends from SpanishPod101.com. I'm Efraín. And I'm Diego. And today we're gonna give you a quick guide to survive to Mexican Spanish. Enjoy, Enjoy the video! video. Woo! Mexico is a very beautiful place to visit because of its people, because of its culture uh, and many other things. But there is something in the communication that becomes slightly difficult because we have so many usages that are not used in other countries. Give us an example, Diego. Yeah, so for example, so we have a difference between the use of pretérito perfecto and the pretérito indefinido because, for example, in, in Spain, they tend to use the pretérito perfecto uh, for an action that ended recently. So they will say something like, esta mañana he desayunado cereal or hoy he desayunado cereal. However, in Mexico, we wouldn't say it in that way. We would rather say, esta mañana desayuné cereal or Hoy desayuné cereal. Now, in Mexico, many things are small. And I don't say that because of the size of the things, but rather because we tend to use a diminutive in so many occasions. So, for example, for showing courtesy or hospitality or kindness, or even when we ask for something, and uh, we want to be polite. Uh, so we can use it, for example, in the adjectives. I could say, Efraín es... Chaparrito. Efraín is short. But we could also use it in the nouns. So we will give you more examples. Diego, como que hace calorcito, ¿no? Sí, hace un poquito de calor. Se... Ah, sonará extraño, pero se me antojó un cafecito. Claro, pero en un ratito que terminemos el video, te lo preparo. Ok, y ahorita me lo haces, ¿eh? Claro que sí. Va. There is another huge difference. Mexicans are incapable of saying no. So we create pretexts, excuses, and we delay the offer. Uh, that is something that people of other countries hate about us. So it wouldn't be strange to hear things like, sí, pero al ratito. Muy probablemente 
Pero yo te aviso. Te confirmo al rato. Oh, tal vez. Um, al rato quedamos. O nos marcamos después. So when you hear stuff like that, the other person might be declining your petition. For example, Diego, deberíamos ir a una fiesta hoy. Escuché que esta Ana va, va a dar una fiesta en su casa a las 8. Oh, eh, esa noche. Bueno, <laughs> es que ya tenía un plan con unos amigos. Oh. No estoy seguro. Pues invítalos, invítalos. Eh, sí, sí, pero eh, bueno, yo te confirmo más al ratito. Ok. Yeah. Sí, tú me dices. Sí, sí. Another thing you need to know before coming to Mexico is that we tend to overuse the reflexive pronoun te and the suffix le. As we know, the reflexive pronoun te, we use it all the time whenever we use an reflexive verb. And the suffix le is for an indirect object. However, in Mexico, we use the reflexive pronoun te for a request that we want to make it sound more friendly uh, for cheering up the person whom we are asking the, the request. So I could say, Efra, léete el libro de Rayuela de Julio Cortázar. Es muy, muy bueno. Okay, seguro. And the suffix le, we use it for, once again, another, this is another imperative. And we use it whenever we want something to be done quickly. And it's also kind of friendly and cheerful. So we could probably say, we can use it in the verb correr. It doesn't really need an indirect object. So it wouldn't be strange to hear in Mexico a thing such as, Efra, correle, que se nos va a hacer tarde para ir al cine. We will give you another example. Diego, échate este vino conmigo, al fin ya no tiene mucho. No, Efra, tú sabes que yo, yo ya no tomo. Nomás un traguito, Diego. No, 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 no. Ah, qué... Pero, ¿qué, ¿qué tienes? ¿Estás eh, un poco triste o algo? No, oh, no, todo bien, Diego, todo bien. Te veo un poco animado. A ver, cántate una canción. Amigo, ¿qué te pasa? Estás llorando. Pero cántale sí. con ganas. Amigo, ¿qué te pasa? Estás llorando. Seguro es por destenes de mujeres. <laughs> no hay golpe más mortal para los hombres. So, this is it, friends from SpanishPod101.com. We hope you have enjoyed this video. And give us your thumbs up if you want to come to Mexico and meet some friends here. Uh, let us know your opinion right below um, in our comment section <laughs> and see you in the next video. See you! Expand your vocabulary with our core 2000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free Spanish ebook before it's gone.